Hey everyone, welcome back to Policy Punchline. Here at the show, we interview scholars, policymakers, and business executives about some of the most urgent issues and frontier ideas in our world today. I'm Princeton senior Tiger Gao. Uh, today, I'm very honored to have Paul Haga on the show. He was the acting CEO of NPR, the National Public Radio, and, and was the chairman of the board as well for three years. Uh, he was on the board for uh, more than nine years, and he is also the former chairman of the Capital Research and Management Company. Uh, he retired from the Capital Group at the end of 2012, but is also now a tr trustee at Princeton University. So, Paul, thanks so much for joining me today. Thank you for having me, Tiger and Francesca. It's wonderful to be here. Yes, and, and co-hosting the show is my friend, uh, Francesca Walton. She is a senior uh, in the School of Public International Affairs here at Princeton and a longtime member of our team. Uh, thanks for being here with me, Frank. Yeah, this is great. So Paul, maybe we should get started um, just to uh, give our listeners a very broad background about your long career and, and journey because you were undergrad at Princeton, but you also took many twists and turns throughout your career. How did you eventually end up at NPR? Yeah. Um... The, well, I'll, I'll go way back. I uh, grew up in Washington, D.C. suburbs. Um, my parents were kind of typical post-World War II uh, people. My dad was uh, in the Navy in the war, and he was from Memphis, Tennessee, and my mom was from Boston, and they both ended up in Washington, D.C., working when the government expanded greatly right after World War II. Uh, so I grew up in the D.C. and D.C. suburbs. Um, went to, I had financial aid to go to Georgetown Prep, a Jesuit high school uh, there, which was a great, uh, great start to my uh, academic career. Uh, and then I, uh, after parochial schools in the neighborhood, then I went to uh, Princeton for four years. And then I, uh, I was economics major and I thought I'd always a re research assistant. I thought I'd become an economics professor, but it became very mathematical and kind of lost my interest. I'm, I would be now more interested in the uh, behavioral economic side of it. If it, that had been around when I was there, I'd probably still have done that. So I couldn't decide between law school and business school, but I know I wanted to go to grad school. And uh, the year before I was my, uh, applying, um, University of Pennsylvania and a few other places started a joint JD MBA program. So I went to that and it was more of a non-decision than a decision. And I uh, had a wonderful career there. While I was there, just through an accident uh, with through a friend met, uh, um, uh, I was offered a job as a law clerk at what became, while I was there, became Vanguard Mutual Fund Group. And I was in mutual funds ever since my entire career. It was just a happenstance. So when I, when I talk to young people, I always tell them to be open to serendipity because this was serendipity that literally made a career for me. Um, how I got involved with NPR, I'd been listening to NPR forever. I started listening when I came to DC in 1974 and I listened to Bluegrass on WAMU Sunday, Saturday and Sunday mornings. And then I heard the newscasts and I liked them. And so I started listening to the NPR news. This was only three, NPR is 50 years old this year. And this was three years into its existence. So I've been listening uh, forever, but like a lot of, it's funny when we talk about getting people involved in NPR, we talk about gateway drugs and mine was, the uh, mine was bluegrass. Uh, for many young people now, it's podcast. So congratulations! You don't, you probably don't think of yourself as a gateway <laughs> to, <laughs> to further engagement with uh, journalism and media, but you are. So, yeah, I mean, yeah, podcasting is really this new thing these days. I mean, it's more, I guess, on demand. Uh, a lot of independent uh, comedians and yeah. political commentators, public intellectuals, everybody's doing podcasts these days. Uh, yeah, so perhaps we could go back to the beginning when you uh, joined NPR. I, I, if I'm correct, uh, did you join NPR board as its only Republican at the time? I, I, I did. What happened was they kind of ham-handedly fired Juan Williams, and that's a long story that I won't go into, but basically the head of New, he was the only Republican. He was also on Fox at the time. He was one of our few African-American um, uh, uh you know, host of a show and uh, very well liked. And he, um, somebody misquoted him and the woman in charge of the newsroom faxed him a letter firing him. The board didn't know, the stations didn't know. She just went ahead and did it. And she, the woman, Ellen Weiss, who did that now calls herself the poster child for sleeping on it. 
um because if she if she just you know she you can always fire somebody yeah. <laughs> if she waited a few hours yeah. she might have, things might have been different but anyway um so she hand so npr got in a lot of trouble I and mean, of course the the person who did was in trouble with the, the board didn't know and that was kind of embarrassing when the people started calling the board members and saying what about juan williams and they didn't even know what happened so uh, that you know among other lessons uh just management lessons from that uh clue people in, please. Um, but anyway, what happened was they got in trouble and they were in trouble on the Hill, particularly with a lot of Republican congressmen. And um, they looked at their board and the board was smaller than, I think it was a total of 17. And they were all identifiably Democrats. Um, and they said, help, we need a Republican, hopefully somebody who's both identifiably Republican and maybe has done a little work on Capitol Hill. And luckily, my station manager was on the board at the time, KPCC in Pasadena, and uh, he raised his hand. He said, well, I know this guy, Paul Hager, who he's a identifiably Republican and um, he um, is and he's done. I'd done lobbying for the mutual fund industry because I was chair of the trade association. So I knew new people on the Hill. And he and he said and, and he just gave me a big contribution for my capital campaign. So I'm guessing he likes NPR. So they. They called me up and they said, um, do you want to be on the board? And I, I knew one person, you know, you usually get interviewed by a few people and they just they just told me the dates of the meetings and I said, sure, I'll do it. So I thought I'd have a little fun. I'm not making this up. I went to my first meeting and I found a way to uh, weave into the conversation that I think the earth is 6,000 years old and the animals showed up fully formed. And half the people laughed and half the people elbowed the person next to him and said, I told you so, they're all like that. <laughs> so anyway, so I had, I had a great experience. We'll get into some of that, I'm sure, but I had a great experience. People treated me very well. Um, I'm sure they rolled their eyes about me at other times, but, um, but it, 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 was a, it was a wonderful experience and I really loved it. And I'd only been on the board, I'd been on the board less than a year and they made me chair of the finance committee and vice chair of the board. And then I'd been on about two years when uh, um, the CEO left suddenly and they asked me to be acting chair because I just retired from capital, or excuse me, acting CEO. And I had a wonderful experience as acting CEO. That's great to hear. I, uh, this is, you know, perhaps a loaded question, but I, I think especially in college or just, you know, right now when the media is so polarized and, you know, people will say, oh, you know, you're conservative, you're liberal and they'll, you know, identity politics come into play and, you know, people begin to make assumptions. I think I have a tendency to, you know, back away and, almost not, you know, talk politics, but I love that you made a joke of it because I think that, you know, kind of lightens the mood and makes everyone, you know, feel a lot better. I, um, but okay, I, I wanted to ask too. Yep. Um, so, you know, you came to NPR and, you know, to my understanding, you didn't have as much, you know, specific journalism experience and, you know, others did and, you know, different roles. Um, but, you know, what was that, you know, experience for you? I mean, did, were you ever concerned that, okay, people, I mean, I know that, you know, politics was coming into play, but were people ever, were you concerned that people would think, okay, but he doesn't have as much journalism experience, you know, what is he really going to contribute? Or yeah, could you talk a little bit more about yeah. your experience and how you're connected <clears throat> with others? Yeah, really interesting. In my um, first speech to the, back in 2013, in my first speech to, to the entire, NPR workforce, I said two things. One is it's a myth that I have no journalism experience. I was the editor in chief of the Georgetown Prep Little Hoya newspaper back in 1965. <laughs> the other thing I said to him was I looked out over the crowd. And of course, in those days, we, we, we didn't have very many podcasts. We didn't have any video at all. Uh, we were just all radio. And I looked out and I said, wow, you guys are much better looking than you need to be for radio. Um, but seriously, um, y y y it's a little bit of an effect. I, I would have um, fully trust, I trusted myself to you know, chair a meeting and I trusted myself to draw people out 
I trusted myself to get the right people in the right room. And that was one of the things I fixed early on is that people weren't communicating. There were silos. And I just said, you guys need to communicate. And I wanted to hear all voices before making a decision. And 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 there were some sort of captives, uh, which happens in organizations where you keep just because the CEO gets overwhelmed, they start listening to fewer and fewer people and they get captive and then they're they're missing important points. And I, I, from my experience, I knew how to do that, but I, I really didn't, I didn't think that I could, I couldn't trust myself to hire a good head of news. I would really need help with that kind of thing. So um, was I, um, could, could I help the place? Could I make changes? Yes. Some people said, well, why don't you just stay here and run it permanently and apply for the CEO job? And I said, no. And a lot of that was the lack of specific experience. So when people think, <clears throat> people will sometimes pretend that leaders are interchangeable and that the subject matter doesn't, it doesn't count. It's really, um, it, it's just the leadership, the generic leadership skills, not true. Um, it's, it's also not totally untrue. You can make a difference if you, even if you don't have the specific experience, but to really lead it well, you'd need both leadership experience and I would have needed a better understanding of uh, an experience with journalism. For sure, no, I see exactly what you're saying. I also want to caveat that um, I did know about your past journalism you know, experience. I guess I just in my head had imagined that perhaps I need to do more research on this, but perhaps you know, CEOs that come in, you know, they may have come from a more direct like journalism role. So that's really where the question you know, was coming from. Oh yeah, I know that, no, my, my my uh, high school journalism was was a joke. That was that was that was me that was me pretending, <laughs> which is another well. good leadership skill: being able to pretend. You... <laughs> yeah, exactly. But I also I also would just say too that you know when I take a you know step back, I really think like okay, wait a second. You know, some of the journalists you know that I know, I don't really know if they could really step into a CEO, CEO position just because, you know, both require such different um, yep. skill sets. But anyway, glad, you know, glad we uh, covered that. But you know, just, just... let me jump in on that, because one of the things, you know, when people ask me what, you know, what, the, what are things you've learned in your life? And as you reflect back, and one of the really important things I've learned, in fact, the one of the most useful things I've learned is that many there are many, many kinds of smart. Few of us are none of them. No one's all of them. And so fit is often so much more important. And when people hire resumes and grades, for that's where a lot of misfits come from. And so it, 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 and often it's not specifically experience but it's experience in that Bureau of Labor Statistics job title category, but it's specific. So, you know, you, you have to be, to be a good journalist, you have to be a good communicator, to be a good, lots of, I was a lawyer most of my career. To be a good lawyer, you have to be a good communicator. So uh, yes, communication skills are the essence and the bedrock of it. Um, the specific practices of either law or journalism or some other form of communication are kind of refinements and they're important refinements as I discussed, but they're not the basis, the basic of it. And that's why, you know, we want to talk about, about this journalism program. And, you know, I think of it as the communication and the program. And, you know, I, th I think that I think that it's great that Princeton has a journalism program. I'm great that they're applying communication skills that get taught throughout the liberal arts curriculum into that specific mode of practice. But, you know, classics, I wouldn't have a necessarily have journalism major. And if I did, I'd want to make sure that I limited the number of courses you took because I want to make sure people are reading the Aeneid in the original Latin is great preparation for having a podcast. Yeah, I, I go back and forth on it because I mean, you know that, or maybe you don't know, I 
um, the journalism department is so new. I mean, there have been classes, but the certificate is very new. And there's a big part of me that really wants to, you know, revamp it. And in every way, I'm, um, I consider uh, Professor Stevens the uh, director of the journalism department to, you know, be a good friend. I always like rely on him for. What a good guy! Yeah. Yes. Yeah, Merle and I rely on him for advice, and he always, you know, gives the best advice. Man, I hope he tunes into this podcast. Yeah. But, um, I, you know how I got to your class, uh, Francesca, was he, I was look, reading one of uh, the Princeton, the alumni bulletin, and there was an article about the journalism class, and Joe was teaching it or something like that, and I, I, had, I hadn't met him, I didn't know him, and I, I sort of knew there was a journalism program, but not, not really. But he had a bit in the picture, he had a big NVR mug on his desk. So I looked him, I looked him up, I emailed him and I said, thanks for having the NPR mug. And then he emailed me back and we became friends and then he invited me to your class. Yeah, so, the rest is history. Is wow. Happened. But so put more swag on your desk. <laughs> You'll attract interesting people. Uh, no, for sure. Now I'm wishing that I, uh, and you were so kind to give us, you know, NPR gear and I cherished it. I don't have it in the basement with me here, but, um, and that was just such a you know great conference and it was great having you uh, in the class. Well, come back. That's good. I mean, here's another thing. I, he said to come speak. And I thought, well, you know, I don't think you want me to come in and talk about the role of the audit committee on the NPR board. So let me find somebody who, who <laughs> is more interesting and fun for him. So I got Sasha Pfeiffer. Um, because I, not I noticed that you guys had read um, um, her, uh, her story uh, about the, it's called um, Spotlight. Uh, yes. It's about the priestly abuse in Boston. So I said, let me... Uh, email you know Sasha and you know if you're generally nice to people I didn't really know her but if you're generally nice to people and people are inclined to think well of your reputation then when you email them and say can you spend a half an hour teaching my class so they don't have to hear about the role of the audience <laughs> uh, and she came in and it, it, you you like this tiger that the they were asking all these serious questions about journalism but they desperately wanted to know what it was like being played by someone in a movie about you. And I could <laughs> tell that the, 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 as we're getting toward the end of the half hour, I could tell the students were getting, you know, worrying that we weren't going to talk about that. So I, I called a halt to the real stuff and I said, okay, talk about the movie. And remember that was, of course, the most fun part. <laughs> you know? Man, wait, that was, gosh, just I can't believe that was well two years ago must two have been ago. that you've been yeah. come to our class. But okay, I want to just circle back to the department. I, I completely see what you're saying in terms of how you know journalism shouldn't necessarily be a major, and, and I agree. I think that you know, me, I'm um, going into journalism uh, post-college. I hope to tell you more um, about it. Uh, you know, won't bother the yeah. audience with that now. Um, but I, I really thought a lot about our journalism part department and thought, wow, you know, we really strengthen our print journalism side. But when it comes to podcasts, when it comes to other mediums, the, the department is, you know, is really weak in that area. And so yeah. I've you know, been trying to brainstorm, you know, brainstorm with Joe, but I just also, you know, wanted to circle back um, to podcasts and the rise of like independent journalism and how, you know, even these classes could be teaching us this and, how, you know, I think now a lot of people are relying on Substack and, you know, fewer Americans are tuning in to your major sources. And, you know, I want to say that I think our, our department is feeding perhaps or preparing students for those major sources. But as we've discussed, you know, I, journalism now has taken so many different shapes, sizes, forms, and, I, I want to ask you, you know, how you may, one, see the media evolving, but, but specifically, how do you see NPR evolving as these different platforms are taking hold and a lot of the audience is, you know, kind of turning their attention to new mediums? Yeah, that's great. great. That's, that, that sort of sums up the future of NPR, essentially. But let me just, let me go back to the journalism department. Um, Princeton has, throughout its history, has scrupulously avoided 
any pretense that they're preparing you for an actual career and other than an academic career. And so we've never had a business school. We had a law school for one year at the turn of the last century uh, and then got rid of it. The building's still there, by the way, up on Nassau Street. It's a bank now that used to be the law school. Um, we don't have a business school, but we have operations research and financial engineering which is equivalent to a business school, but we wouldn't dream of calling it that. Journalism sounds like a profession. So, you, you know, it, it, the truth is it doesn't matter whether your department, on the subject of the, the sort of the, using the oral versus print, um, I would say uh, yes and to that. I would add the oral stuff, but don't substitute it for the print. Because when you think about it, the print, journalism is, is the one place where you can really be reflective and you have the time frame to think about what you've written and you can update, you can sleep on it as my friend Ellen Weiss would say and you can reflect and you can go back. Uh, it's not spontaneous. And so, and I think that ability to do that, that it, it helps you to be better even when you're doing the oral journalism and the podcast, because you've had the experience of thinking and rethinking and revising and, and stuff. So don't lose the print, even if the whole world goes to, uh, goes to podcast. As to the podcast, you know, we knew early on we were going to have to, um, uh, uh, we would have to meet people where they are. And I remember when I, when I was CEO and I met with about 50 kids who were the uh, interns starting the summer program. And I said, you know, raise your hand if you have a radio other than the one that came with your car. And about three hands went up. And I said that, you know, that's the future you've got to prepare us uh, for. I remember the fir literally the first day, and this is something about leadership. The first day I was CEO, you won't be surprised that multiple people came to my office and told me everything I needed to know about running NPR. And one of them was a, um, one of our hosts who's now retired, but he's even older than me. And he came in and he sat down and he said, now Paul, he says, don't get carried away with all this uh, online stuff um, because none of my friends listens to podcasts or anything. And I said, I said, well, Robert, none of my friends does either, but I don't think we're the target <laughs> demographic for the <laughs> Philco radio with tubes yeah. that we're replacing once in a while. Yeah. You know, we're not the future. So the you, you got to meet people where they are. Um, you got to produce things that like you don't have to, you know, pander to sort of the currency because pe I believe people will people will be attracted to the yelling and the negativity and stuff, but that's not all they want. That that's um, that's a snack, not a meal. And so I, I just I you know I don't despair of journalism based on what's currently going on in the um, uh, cable news uh, area as much as some people might, or the you know right wing talk radio or far left stuff, Pacifica, things like that. I just, I, I, I think people are smarter than that, but I think we need to, we need to give them quality things that aren't out there, that are thoughtful, that are, that are in depth. And as long as we do that, one of the things I, you know, when people say, well, you know, how do you uh, avoid, um, how do you avoid bias? Well, one of the ways you avoid bias is just to talk for a long time. Um, if you're do if you're doing a 20 second piece, you can be as biased as you want. If you have to talk for seven minutes, somewhere in there you're going to say. On the other hand, you have to get to some of the nuance. You have to get to some of the other considerations. You have to get to some of the complexity, and that's where the, that's complexity and nuance and length are the antidote to bias. Because it, it, the world's complicated, and if you talk long enough, you'll 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 get at least some of the other considerations out there. Uh, Paul, we should really talk a little bit more about, I guess, the rise of independent journalism and NPR. And before we uh, I, 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 asking you more about the bias component, because um, I, I think what we're seeing is. Uh, uh, I still remember talking to some business people when they were saying how serious serious XM was really struggling in business back then. But when they signed Howard Stern, 
uh, their um, <laughs> the stock price really went up back back up yeah. again. And recently we saw Spotify signing Joe Rogan. That was really seen as the deal of the century. That's uh, you know. Uh, sort of allowing Spotify to kind of be at the at the center of, of media of podcasting again, this future of audio and everybody's jumping into this space. And I was just wondering, I mean, we see all the Silicon Valley tech companies, we see all the startups talking about media, podcasting, newsletter, all that stuff. Uh, it seems that the traditional media, especially public um, institutions like NPR have been very quiet in, in some of these at large scale media transformation. So, so I guess my question would be, uh, do you think public institutions like NPR uh, should try to chase the trend or, or are they slow to pivot or should they not pivot? I mean, how do you see these things uh, as so many others seem to be chasing uh, new trends? Yeah, thank you. It's hard to give a short, first of all, the, the, you know, I'm, I'm gonna bet that a lot of people came to Sirius initially to hear Howard Stern, the same way I came to WAMU to hear bluegrass, and that then they, you know, they've expanded there. And I can't believe that there aren't some people listening to other things that started with Howard Stern. And it's pretty hard to, you know, shock jocks and really biased people have a hard time sustaining um, <clears throat> intelligent people forever. Um, so they'll always have a niche. They'll always have a role. But they're not going to. They'll never take over the the whole market. You know the 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 so the, it's kind of the role of NBR. I was interested in you. You in talked about the Academy of Arts and Sciences Commission on the Practice of Democratic Citizenship listed media reform as a central pillar of democracy. These reforms, including establishing publicly funded local investigative journalism, and enacting a public interest mandate from for for profit, said well. You know, Earth to the Commission, NPR and PBS. This thing that you're urging us to invent has been around 50 years. We already have that. We have nonprofit public interest uh, journalism, and we're making a huge, and I know this is getting a little away from the original question, but we're, we've made a huge thrust. And in fact, Heather and I have been big sponsors of it um, to enhance local media. Um, and to um, an NPR now has regional um, media hubs where we we have editor we, we have a local you know focus, but we have editors who can help with the editing and training uh, and supplementing of local journalists and the local journalists collaborate among each other in a region and we're enhancing, Journalism. So it's not one 22 year old recent graduate who's the only journalist in, in their station. They, they still might be the only journalist in their station, but they've now got an ecosystem that supports them regionally and nationally. And so I think that's, and I, again, I'm sorry for getting away from your question, but I think that's really the answer. We have found whenever we take surveys, and this, is, this has been going on forever, and we ask, what are your favorite things? We ask listeners, what are your favorite things about NPR? Local journalism is always first. And then after that comes all things considered and morning edition and wait, wait, don't tell me and all the other, uh, all the other stuff. But the first is local journalism. And so we, we take that to heart and uh, um, we think we can be there. The hard thing is investigative journalism because you know, I, I have fun raising money for investigative journalism because I can go to a friend and say, you know what, you're, you're smart enough and dedicated enough and generous enough that you'd be willing to give us a couple hundred thousand bucks to do an investigative uh, piece that may never air. And has to, we have to be able to not air it because it actually may not be what we thought it was and we have to do the investigation. And that takes a sophisticated person. People are flattered by that, but it's also hard to, it's hard to spend money on things that may not happen. And that's the essence of investigative journalism. You have to be willing to investigate things that weren't what you thought they were and chase and, them down and you have to hold people responsible. And it's, it's, it's not, you know, you don't produce a weekly half hour broadcast from an investigative uh, department, but you, you do what journalism has always done, their huge role of, uh, uh, of calling people to account. No, for sure. I think it's also interesting too, because, you know, you talk about the expense and the effort that goes into investigative journalism, but now with social media, 
you know, users are just taking a picture of a scene, posting it to Twitter, there it goes, you know, everyone's, you know, become a, you know, journalist to some extent. And I, you know, just to go back to local journalism, I think that, you know, I'm with you, I, I think it's, gosh, so important, it's important that it's reliable. I think a lot of people really question, like, okay, is like how reliable is my um, local, um, my local journalism and, you know, over 65 million Americans um, live in a county where there is minimal, minimal yep. local journalism. And I think, you know, their only hope then is just to, I shouldn't say the, their only hope, but of course they're naturally then going to look yep. towards the New York City or, you know, national, um, national journalism. But I mean, how do you think like social media has like affected journalism? I think in some way, like there are a lot of positives, there are a lot of negatives. You talk about the misinformation, disinformation, et cetera. But yeah, could you talk a little bit about how like social media is affecting local journalism and in turn national journalism? The influence of social media is huge. And of course there's the economic influence that people can bypass the, you know, they don't have to subscribe to the New York Times if they can find articles about it through social media or on Facebook or something like that. So that's an obvious thing. And I think that's the economic one. And I'm not sure, you, I don't think, I think you, that's important, but I think it's the way you framed the question is more important, which is what is the influence on content uh, from that, that people get used to that. You know, I'll, I'll back up a little bit. And there was a really interesting article. Um, actually it was at my 45th reunion, I did a panel on the alumni faculty forums on journalism. And in preparing for it, I found this article about um, the, um, uh, about the, the, the new, you know, forms of journalism, forms of communication. Uh, and um, it, it, it was a, by a woman for the uh, um, uh, uh, Manchester Guardian had written it. And she said that the, uh, we've gone back, that she, ref she said we're now in the pre-Gutenberg era. She said before Gutenberg, everybody got their news from the marketplace. People wandering had come from another area and people talked and there weren't any edited, um, curated, selected professional sources of information. It was literally the marketplace. And then we had 500 years of post Gutenberg where it was the sage on the stage handing down curated wisdom and expertise that you could trust had been, um, whether it was because of the, who published the book or you know who was, who was broadcasting it or who was publishing the newspaper, you could trust that you, you, you may not like what they said, but it, it, you, you knew it had at least been, been edited and curated. And she said, now we're back to the, 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 the open marketplace and we have zillions of people most of whom are unsupervised in any way that are now the marketplace. And so we have to do what we did pre Gutenberg, which is find trusted sources because the people in the marketplace had to decide over time based on experience, who do you listen to, who, who, whom do you not listen to? And we are sort of back to that. And so the impact I think Francesca isn't to make um, the more mainstream sources of media go away, but it's to put the burden on them to not be trusted just because they exist and they're the only game in town, but to be trusted because they give reliable, in-depth information that's useful. And as people sort out the, the multiple, multiple voices and the noise, they sort themselves out toward the reliable podcasts like the one we're recording today. Uh, Paul, just to quickly follow up on that, when we would come to talking about funding public interest media, talking about, uh, you know, quote unquote, uh, neutral journalism or local journalism, uh, what do you think are some of the policy uh, resolutions that you have in, in mind? We, we know that Nicholas Lemon, who is the Dean of the Columbia Journalism School uh, and who does a lot of long form reporting and, and he's been an advocate of you know setting aside of you know public funds to help uh, local journalism a lot of people have been talking about how the death of local journalism exacerbates yeah. uh, the, the the polarization so uh, i know you talked about how we should totally fund you know pbs and npr a little bit more from from the public so do, do you think another portion of the public funds should be devoted to 
uh, maybe cultivating local newspapers or something else? Yeah, great, great question. And um, the um, uh, here's the actual funding structure, PBS. Um, and by the way, under the Trump years, PBS got its first increase in funding in more than 20 years. So when everybody says Trump's trying to kill him, he actually increased the funding. So, you know, facts. Um, the, and we've gotten some stimulus money too, which has been good. We meaning the whole public broadcast. Um, Corporation for Public Broadcasting, as you know, is a private organization that's government funded and it basically funds public interest, nonprofit journalism. About 60% of their money goes to television and 40% to uh, radio or, or, you know, radio plus. Um, the, in, the, in the NPR, ecosystem, about 10% of the total funding is from Corporation for Public Broadcasting, but it almost all of it goes direct, about 1% of that comes to us to launch us to NPR itself to launch the satellite and do other things. Most of it goes to the stations themselves. And it's progressive with the stations. So about 4% of WNYC and WHYY's money, annual funding comes from the government. About 50% of a local stations comes from the government. So it's, it's already skewed toward helping local journalism, um, very much skewed toward helping local journalism. Would I like it to see it get more skewed? Yes, frankly. Um, and, you know, we do a little, we NPR Inc. do a little skewing ourselves because we charge more. Um, the, the, more the larger your revenue, the more we charge you for morning edition, um, even on a per listener basis. So there's some, there's the, the, what you, what he, Nicholas brought up and what you just um, talked about is already going on. It, it obviously it could benefit from more. Um, you know, public, I, I, I would be happy with some more public funding, but I think also user funding, it's a great discipline that we have to convince sponsors, foundations, and others to support our journalism. If we got it all from the government, we could be trust fund babies and get lazy. Um, and, and so I like the fact, I like the discipline of having to go out there and uh, raise money ourselves and convince people that we that we make a difference. Um, could we use a little more government funding? Sure. Um, is it adequate? You know, we're surviving. We've got, uh, what is it, 263 members, and that's how many we had 10 years ago. Um, not, there are more than that stations, about a thousand stations, but these are member organizations. So um, one of our challenges, by the way, that people don't talk about, a lot of our licensees, our, our licensees, there's kind of two kinds of licensees. One is community-based, a local nonprofit, and the other is university licensees. And the university licensees are part of a university ecosystem. So they feel all the pressures and challenges of a university. So even if they raise, you know, sometimes when they raise a lot of money, um, the university gives them less. And a lot of the universities that have licenses, I wish Princeton had one, but they don't. Um, but a lot of them have their own challenges. So it's, it's it, you know, we're, we're sharing in other challenges as well, namely that of higher education. Yeah, no, I, well said. I think that, you know, not to backtrack to social media, but I think what's also really, um, yeah, huge consideration for social media is, you know, I think a lot of people will really turn more towards social media and say, okay, I don't need this New York Times subscription. I, I don't need this subscription and that subscription because I'll rely on Facebook to, you know, get similar information. And that's all I really need to know. And we'll leave it at that. I think that you're really now talking to a different audience who's willing to spend that money reading the long form pieces. Um, but, you know, that's, that's neither here nor there. I, I also want to get more into, you know, bias. Um, and uh, especially, you know, within, within um, NPR and I, uh, yeah, I mean, I think that, you know, it's, 
I think we would all agree there's, you know, important to have, you know, neutral journalism. Um, mm-hmm. But, you know, of course, that I think part of journalism is like the business behind it. And I think a lot of um, outlets will say, okay, let's find our specific niche niche and let's run with it. You know, take Fox News, huge yep. success story. They were able to find their loyal base and, you know, now they're, you know, crushing um, really just across the board, but especially, you know, with their anchors and, you know, their shows, um, you know, crushing statistics. But I, I want to ask you like what you think and, you know, how public media um, can, you know, can help people form their political ideologies, but, you know, also in some ways like reconcile this tension of, you know, one side or the other. Um, Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, it, it, it really important, and, and I, I just I think if there's if there was a mission statement, I'd frame it. If we were rewriting our mission statement, I'd probably borrow your words, Francesca, and put them in there because it, it it's just really important. Um, and again, it's so easy to fall into the trap of being the 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 opposition or um, you know, the, the revolution or something that the, remember in 2016, um, I was board chair then of NBR, and when Trump got elected, a lot, you know, the basically CNN and MSNBC resigned from the journalism profession and became advocates. And they just, they basically said that. They just said, we're now the resistance. And people at NPR wanted to, we didn't, we didn't want to say that because we understand that's wrong, but there were people who said, who wanted to use in our fundraising messages now more than ever. And I said, do not, I, I put an absolute, I usually, I don't often, you know, wash people's mouths out with soap for saying bad words, but for that, I said, no one may say that at NPR because if it's now more than ever, then who are we in four or eight years when there's no more Trump? And we can't say now more than, what do we say now? You don't need us anymore because, you know, Trump's gone. Um, and so I, I put the kibosh on that. And of course, you know, people that, you know, CNN, MSNBC, can you say that? I think they, I think, you know, one of the reasons their, their uh, ratings and such have declined was because they did say, we're going to take sides. And so they're there for, you know, reinforcement and ammo for your next cocktail party, but they're not really there to be enlightening people and people are smarter than that. Now, NBR is mostly Democrats. I I just, I will freely admit that, but they're thoughtful Democrats and they're Democrats who don't think they have the answers that the left or the Democratic Party has the answers to everything. I always tell people I'm a Republican because I think the Republicans get it wrong slightly less often than the Democrats. And people, thoughtful people do approach it that way, that it's not all one or another. And I find, you know, I have most of my friends are Democrats, partly because of where I hang out and museum and university boards and things like that. And I have very good conversations with them because, you know, people will carry around a sign saying something but then when you actually talk to them about and say what about this what about that then we find we're always closer together than we think we think we are and so i I, again it get it kind of gets back to long form um almost francesca that that if you you can continue to talk about things in depth and we talk about a lot of things that you, you couldn't you couldn't figure out one of the things because we do such long form journalism and we do such in depth stuff that it, it's you talk about a lot of things where you, it's it's really hard to, um, f- to to figure out what's the left right angle to this story. Uh, we did the f- the fires in California, and I remember two of our guys were covering. They were sleeping in tents covering the Paradise Fire, and at the this is this is complete boasting, mm-hmm. but I'll say it anyway. The they were at a speech that the mayor gave several weeks after the fire was out and he stood up there and he said, you know, the press is gone. Nobody's talking about this, but the real news is going to be our recovery. And the two guys in the back from NPR raised their hands and say, no, the press isn't gone and we're never going to be gone. We're still covering the Paradise Fire. And that's what real journalism is. Covering the real story is how do you recover from a fire, not how many homes burn today. 
And I, I think there's a, t I, I believe there's a taste for that journalism. I believe there's a taste both in the listening public and in foundations and individuals who will support such things. And we may have a niche audience, but we'll have an audience. Yes, Paul, just to quickly follow up on that, I think it's really interesting. Uh, what we saw is on one hand, you have, uh, you know, more short and sweet form kind of clickbaity social media type of journalism but there's also this rise of long-form podcasting we have podcasts that are like four hours long and people really listen to them so i, I think in, in some sense we could even say um you have to trust the listener to say they actually do want good content they want to be able yeah. to reason through something for four hours you can't just uh stand from a sort of very aggrandized it, it, sort of moral high ground and say they they only want five minute content so i'm just going to yeah. give them really trash stuff yeah. Um, well, yes. and you, you know, you can do both. Um, two of the podcasts that were started by close friends of mine, um, and I got involved in helping the startup and the fundraising. One is Through Line, and the other is Hidden Brain. And each of those has a piece on, often on Friday, on Morning Edition, they'll do a piece. And uh, Rund and Ramteen uh, from Through Line will come on. Um, and we'll talk about what they're doing. And if you want the rest of the story, and it's a very interesting one or two minute story that they give, but it's even more in depth, the one hour story. So I don't see, it doesn't have to be an either or. You can listen to uh, Shankar Vedantam about Hidden Brain and you can hear him. He has three or four, he has a podcast, he has a show, uh, and he has two minutes on morning edition. So he has three forms, each longer than the other, each interesting, each entertaining, and you can do one or two or all three. And the same thing for Rundan Ramteen with Throughline, which you'd love. Throughline is about a, uh, um, uh, it, it's basically the historical explanations of things that are very current today. So it's often news that goes back only 50 or 80 or 60 or even 20 years, but it really explains a lot today. And it's just, it's just a little bit too far back to be in the current news. Uh, Paul, I, I might have to ask a slightly more provocative question, and which is also a very broad question. Do, do you think um, a lot of the legacy media is narrative driven and also broken and 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 this i guess yeah. this is not even a my, my own opinion just everybody seems to say that i mean everybody says uh, the press yeah. has discredited itself it's this one endless and boring recitation of prejudices and biases uh like it, whether you open like washington post or new york times or yeah. other you know right-wing media whatever you can almost immediately know what kind of narrative what side they're going to be on or what kind of stories they're going to be telling you about and there's the lack of intellectual diversity within their own ranks and so on. So I, I don't know, do you agree with this kind of critique? Uh, you know, I think it's, I think it's, I wouldn't, I wouldn't say broken. I think, I think things need to change that aren't broken. The world changes. And so anything that's, anything that's not changing is quickly, at least on its way to broken. And so I think they need to change. And a lot of the stuff that Francesco was talking about, um, uh, illustrates that we need to change we need to be better than you know we're just not going to just have newspapers or just have legacy media you know about 10 years 10 to five years ago uh, when i was exercising um uh, either rowing or, or doing my elliptical i would toggle among fox cnn and msnbc and luckily they're right next to each other and i used to i used to say that if i did that then I got probably 60%, in, in aggregate, I probably get 60% of what I needed to know. And now I get about 20% of what I needed to know because at least in the old days, yes, they'd have a bias, but they would give more reasons for something and give longer observations about things. And so, you know, if I watched all three, I could pick up some. Now they've cut it so short because they don't want to even suggest there's any doubt about so they don't they don't give you seven reasons why something's a good idea of which the last four are weak tea they just give you one or two or three the strongest arguments and you don't even know the weak arguments let alone the other arguments and so yes i think it's gotten worse is it broken you know i still tune them in um i get something from them i can't rely on them exclusively but i bet there's with the exception of Fox and MSNBC, I bet there's not a lot of people that 
rely on only one on only one source exclusively either. So am I worried about an ill-informed or misinformed public? A little bit, uh, but I'm still going to keep plugging away. I don't think it's, I don't think all is lost. Could I ask too, sure. what do you think broadcast may be going in the future? I mean, I, I think that broadcasting you had its at its time to shine, for lack of a you know, better <laughs> phrase. Um, and I think now, you know, who even sits? Okay, well, uh, you know, I, yeah. <laughs> I'll, be, I'll be working in broadcast next year. But like, yeah. you, you know, I think very few people really take the time and like after dinner, you know, sit down in front of the TV and watch cable. And I think, you know, a lot of, or some people do, but I think a lot of people don't. And I guess now, you know, my question or even, you know, worry perhaps is, okay, like, you know, where does, you know, broadcast go? And caveat to that question, in order for broadcast to stay alive and well, I mean, you have your, um, your Rachel Maddow and your Hannity um, and your Tucker Carlson, and you hear them. And I do think Rachel Maddow like tells the story in a very like powerful way. And I think you know, and I, and of course, that's just the nature of, you know, being an anchor. But I mean, I, like, do you, I think a lot of times anchors will say these things just to get their audience to keep listening. And I think yeah. there's this huge fear that you just go so far in one direction or another. And yeah, I mean, do you think cable will really kind of fall apart in some ways? You know, a great observation, Francesca, and, and, and they, they have to stop being that way. I'll just give you one immediate example. I was watching Fox happened to be on Fox among the three um, and the Dodgers and Lakers and Clippers weren't playing. So that would have been <laughs> my fair if, if they'd been on. But I, uh, um, the, a guy on Fox said, uh, NBC News has really done it this time. They've erased the knife from the Columbus, Ohio reporting about the police shooting him. And then they, they flipped to a commercial and I was finished and I was going to go in and I said, no, I've got to stay here and see this. And what I thought from the teaser, what I thought was that they'd shown the film of the cop shooting the woman who was about to stab the girl in the pink thing and that they found a way to cut out the knife so it looked like she was punching her. Not it at all. What happened was they played an excerpt from the police call and it wasn't the expert where she said she's stabbing. But then they showed the film, this is MS, MSNBC. They showed the film and it showed stabbing. So I just said, what? You, you're completely making stuff up and you should be embarrassed because then when the person actually watches it, they realize how incredibly misleading you've been. And I, I often say that there, there, aren't, there isn't very much misinformation it's mostly disinformation. It's mostly sins of admission, omission, not sins of commission. So, you know, somebody told you one thing and they didn't tell you the rest of the, the rest of the story. They'll give, you know, part of somebody's quote and not the one that really mattered. So they didn't lie. They didn't substitute words. I, you know, I think that kind of thing is self-correcting. I think there's, you know, the next time Fox says that, and I'm finished working out, I'm not going to stay through the commercials to see what really happened. I'm going to say this is bullshit and, and it's misleading and I'm not going to hang around. And I, I think I think that it I think there's a there's a self-correcting aspect to it, really. So I don't see a despair of broadcast, but they're going to they're going to have to they're going to have to uh, play more to our collective intelligence, frankly. Yeah, when Rachel you... Maddow is going to have to quit sneering at me because I do watch her <laughs> and I do believe she tells a good narrative, but she sneers at me. Yeah, I, like okay. that. I had an older sister. That was plenty of sneering. <laughs> I will say, though, for this is a little off topic, but for for all the people out there who, you know, want to become anchors, I do really think that, you know, she doesn't fit the mold and she, you know, just her appearance, but also the way she tells stories, I think she has a really unique way of delivering, you know, the news. But, um, okay, quick caveat to what you were, you know, just saying earlier. Um, would you then say, I mean, and I know that was a specific example, yeah. and maybe yeah. there are things that Fox has done well, Fox hasn't, et cetera, okay. and, you know, of course, for other um, networks as well. But would you say that then that change needs to be made from 
you know, higher up? Or is that really the people who are clipping the pieces and I don't know. I think you say you say self-correcting. And so I'm just thinking, okay, where does the self-correcting start? I think it's the I think it's the viewers. I think they'll keep, you know, they'll end up keeping a niche. But, you know, my wife and I, we watch PBS uh, news hour every night while having cocktails right before dinner. We get two newspapers every morning, we get two newspapers thrown into our driveway. And I one of them's the LA Times, one of them's the Wall Street Journal. I talked to a guy who was on the board of the Tribune companies. And I said, um, you know, how's it going financially? And he said, it's fine. What's happened is that immediately when things went online and when all these other sources came, it, there was a steep decline in the number of people who got the paper thrown in their driveway, which is the most expensive and the most profitable. And then that flatlined all the people. Who have, and so it's just people like you, like Paul and Heather Haka. And as you die off, we'll lose this stuff, but you're not going to switch. And I said, you're right. I'll, 10 more years, I'll be getting papers in the driveway. And I think some of the same thing for the for broadcast journalism. It will flatline. Um, but the people are creatures of habit and will still do the same thing. And I think they'll be fine. Will they be as profitable? No. Um, but they'll, you know, they'll, they'll survive. But all the alternatives will continue to thrive. So they'll never... You know, Rachel Maddow will, or, or, or you know, any they, they, the Tucker Carlson is never going to have Walter Cronkite's uh, market share. Just never will happen again. But they can they can have a good business with a much lower market share, and they'll, they'll just stay there. <laughs> Paul, I think maybe this is also a good time to quickly pivot a little bit to a new area, which is we talked a lot about social media, and I think at the center of all this is Facebook. And yes. uh, at, at the center of Facebook's oh, a lot damn. of controversy <laughs> is uh, yeah, you joined Facebook's oversight board very recently as the chairperson of this trust. So uh -huh. uh, would you mind telling us a little bit more about uh, yeah. the oversight board and what right. the trust is? The, yes. And what the, the origin of this, and I sincerely believe this, is Mark Zuckerberg, he doesn't just want to get away from criticism. He honestly, and I've met him several times, I think he honestly believes that corporate executives with his particular background and expertise should not be making these kinds of decisions, that you need people with a different, back to what Francesca and I were discussing about, uh, uh, about experience and training and careers. He really thinks that he's, he's, not, he's good at many, he's many kinds of smart, but not all of them. And that he's that other people should be making these really critical decisions. And so he's sort of they set up this oversight board and they've got it's a lot of judges and human rights act uh, people, journalists, lawyers and others. And but they you know, everybody needs a support and any organization like that needs the oversight board which has 20 members will go to 40 in about a year. Um, but they need uh, they need support. They need somebody to run the operation. They need they need separate funding, and they need somebody not named Mark to report to. So they set up this trust, and they funded it. Uh, Facebook plopped 130 million bucks into it, and they set up the trust. And so the oversight board they call it the Supreme Court, and they people analogize it to a Supreme Court or a human rights commission like you know, the, some of these UN panels or to a self-regulated organization. It's none of them and all of them. There are pieces of the, each of those analogies that fit and some that don't fit. But anyway, so they set up the trust, 130 million bucks. We've got about 60 employees now who, um, we got a board of trustees who runs the business and of which I'm chair and the um, about 60 employees who do research uh, into the zillions of uh, taken down and as of a couple of weeks ago now left up um, uh, pieces uh, on the on the, the on the site and then do the research, help them write the opinions and things like that. So I'm sort of running the show, but I'm I and my fellow trustees and, and our CEO and his senior staff are running this show that supports the oversight board decisions, but we're not actually part of the decisions. So, so Paul, does the oversight board make the decision on 
Facebook's content moderation decisions, basically. So, so there could be appeals or something. Yes, yeah, here's what happened. Yeah, there are thirty thousand people who sit at a computer just like we do around the world, and about four or five thousand who supervise them, and they. AI, uh, artificial intelligence, is picking up through the algorithms, is picking up things and floating it to them and either taking it down or, or not taking it down. And they're making less than one minute decisions about taking things down. And we take down hundreds of thousands of things a day out of the billions of things that get put up. So it's just the first thing to think about is just this mass operation. Um, the um you if your thing is taken down no matter who you are you get to appeal it so you can appeal it and somebody looks at it and instead of spending 20 seconds on it they spend 60 seconds on it or something who's a supervisor so and then you can appeal for if, if, if they say no again you can appeal from that and that gets into this um massive database of things that now the employees of the trust look at and identify for the oversight board members. The oversight board will probably make 50 decisions this year. So they're not looking as much to get things right. You know, if you were a court, you want to do right by the litigants. Um, we're, you know, three months after something got taken down, they're deciding whether to put it back up, kind of so what? You want to get it right, but it's not important. But they look they look for decision, they look for posts that the decision about would lead to either or both of refinements to Facebook's uh, community standards, which are up on the website and are, and are written standards, and or and probably and in most cases, a change to the programming of the algorithms that will identify things to be automatically left up or taken down. And ultimately, and this is the sort of the next step in where we're going, ultimately to the algorithms that do the promotion, uh, broader promotion or lower promotion and less sharing, even if you've left it up, you don't share it with as many people. And that's what you're starting to read about. The, the decisions are not really in a position now to have as much effect on that, but they will. That's the growth area for this whole thing. So it's really, it, it's really individual, the individual decision, take it up, uh, leave it up, take it down, or delete the account, leave, up, leave the account in business are sort of important. And of course, they're really important when it's a leader like a, like a Trump. A newsworthy person, but the 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 I think the broader impact is going to be eventually as it affects the algorithms and both the leave up take down automation and the broadcast don't broadcast algorithm. So stay tuned for that and things things will improve. Will they be perfect? Of course not. Middle school kids will always pick on each other on Facebook, and we can't do anything about that. Uh, Paul, just to quickly follow up on that, whether things will ever be perfect. I mean, a lot of people have been criticizing Facebook. Uh, I mean, people, people, it's like everybody hates Mark Zuckerberg in some way. <laughs> people have a joke about he's that. A good, he's a really good guy, by the way. <laughs> I, I'm sure he is a really nice guy. You know, <laughs> he's a really nice guy. I really like him. I want to have a beer with him. <laughs> I've only got, I've only known him on FaceTime, but I, I can't wait to have a beer with him. <laughs> um, but do you think Facebook have been reluctant to make certain more fundamental changes because of business interests or something? I mean, I, I remember before 2020 election, um, a lot of people were saying that the Facebook's this refusal to take down political ads or F Facebook's a lot of actions to, uh, to help strengthen democracy. I mean, they, they could have done a lot of great things for public good, but they couldn't do it because of shareholder interests and so on. I, I don't know if you, you know, have any closer look, look. Yeah. They're, they're, they are a business, they have shareholders. Yeah. I, sold, I sold my shares when I, so I, I don't say we, because I sold my shares when I took on this role. Um, but the, um, the, the answer is they're a business. So of course that's a factor in things, but to be a business, this gets into this, you know, shareholder versus stakeholder thing in businesses 
to be in business, they need to be trusted. And so in the very short term, it's their interest in their interest to take every political ad they can because they make more money when they take an ad than when they turn it down. They know it's in their long term interest to be a trusted source and to be, you know, broadly representative and to be a place where people want to spend time. So the long term interest is really to do right by people, even if it costs you some money. And they really understand that any discussion that has been, you know, the short term and long term, there's a long term perspective. And I think the same thing when I hear this, and I'm, I'm getting you're gonna to have to insert another question because I'm getting off here. But when I hear this stakeholder capitalism, I just say it isn't shareholders or stakeholders, it's both. The shareholders in the, if you're not pleasing the stakeholders, then you're not gonna have customers, you're not gonna have a public trust, you're not gonna be, so it's short-term versus long-term. And if you think long-term, you're gonna do right by everybody. You're not just gonna make money. If you don't make money in the short-term, there is no long-term. So you have to pay attention to the business aspect, but you also have to pay attention to the longer term. And I think Facebook's doing that. One of the things that I see in the first minute back last January when the headhunter approached me about whether I wanted to do this, in the first minute I said, this is going to be an expectation management challenge because the easiest thing for us would be to get people to say, think, oh, we're now the oversight board, don't worry you know, middle school kids won't pick on each other anymore and there won't be any more, you know, violence. There won't be any more, you know, any Muslim stuff, we'll fix it all. And we've been very disciplined about that and very good about that at not at managing people's expectations about what an enormous task this is. The literally millions, if not hundreds of millions of things that come across that we got to work with. And people are going to naturally expect we'll, We'll get it right all the time. No, we'll get it better, but we won't get it right all the time. And you got to understand we're improving things. We're not perfecting things. And we've been good about that. You know, you, you read these things that, you know, that naturally people who have a single experience with a piece of information or with their own account with us are going to view that as that's their total of their, their experience. They don't think about 2 billion users they think about themselves so they're naturally going to have expectations that are unmanaged but we have to you know and i th and i think i i really I, I praised our communications people for that fact they've never fallen into the the temptation to promise things we can't deliver yeah no of course i uh that's such a good point thinking okay you know this is my experience with facebook this is what i see every day but yeah. Thinking about, you know, other experiences and, you know, my friend, how does she interact with her, you know, content, et cetera. And I think that all comes back to just what we were talking about earlier and, you know, wanting to please the audience, you know, algorithms. Yeah. And I yeah. think the, the goal is, you know, you want to give your audience the best possible um, experience. Right. And oftentimes, you know, that comes down to you want to feed them content that they want to see. Um, and, you know, there are caveats to that, you know, it's a thing it's important to show a range, but it, at, to some extent, you know, you risk people hopping off the app or hopping off the website if they aren't seeing what they want to see. And, you know, that's, you bring in the algorithm conversation yep. and they're, gosh, talk about a double-edged sword. But I, I want to ask you, like, what you think the future may entail in terms of regulating this algorithm yep. Or like just even the business side of it, like, okay, financially, like we need this algorithm to then get to certain ads that, you know, we're, um, we're making money from, you know, yeah. et cetera. Yeah. You know, you said, you said the, 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 the key words, which are double-edged sword and the, the regulation piece, think of section 230. Section 230 says we're a bulletin board, so we're not responsible for the content. You can't sue us for libel based on the content that somebody put up there. Well, if you think about it, the more we get into managing the algorithms, downplaying and upplaying things and taking things down, the less we are a bulletin board and the more we're like a newspaper editor putting stuff out. So the, the better we get 
the less we're going to deserve protection <laughs> at these things. So there's your double-edged sword, Francesca. Is that, you know, we if we do this right, we'll get we'll we'll, we'll then deserve to get sued because oh, yeah. we've and we've created these expectations uh, of people. Um, the, in the second minute of talking to my uh, the headhunters, and I think this is how they found me, is I was very involved in self-regulation. Um, and, and this is the second part of your question. The, the, I was very involved in self-regulation all throughout my career. I started out at the SEC as a regulator. And then my entire career, I was involved with NASD, now FINRA, and with our trade association that did a whole lot of self-regulation. And if you're a self-regulator, you can develop best practices. You don't have to know whether you're in, you know, the, the regulator has to tell you, you are in bounds or out of bounds, period, because they've got, you know, punitive things. A self-regulator can do best practices and encourage everybody and have good housekeeping seals of approval and really accomplish a lot of things beyond what can be accomplished in a pure black and white in bounds, out of bounds uh, setting. So to your question about the, the future of regulation, um, First of all, I hope we don't get regulated by losing 230 and having plaintiffs lawyers nipping, nipping at our heels. I've never, I've never seen um, plaintiffs lawyers cause an industry to get it right. Um, yes, they probably in some cases like healthcare, they've been, they've had a useful experience, but most of them, most plaintiffs lawyers are not enhancing the industry they work in, they're enhancing the private jet industry and the yacht industry because um, it's windfalls. Um, but anyway, back to that, I, you know, I hope that we don't have a lot of content regulation. I hope, because I just, I just think we'll get it wrong. Uh, I, I just, it, it's just so hard to do. And one of the things, you know, the amount of money we've spent and the amount of effort we've spent standing up this sort of quasi self-regulatory organization and trying to improve things. And I think we have, but if a government wants to look at that, if, if, a, if a government looks at us and says, do I want to regulate this thing? I think they would turn and run on their heels. First of all, 20% of our users are in the US. Do you think the other 80% want a US, the FCC regulating us? Do the, again, do, do you think that do you think that how many people in the US want the an EU entity or a UN entity regulating political ads for content on our media? So it, if it's gonna be anything, it has to be global. And then you get immediately into, okay, how do you really convince people that this global organization really understands local nuance? So by the way, we have, when I make our decision, we have five person panels. And you always have to have one from the region um, or more, it's usually gonna be two or three from the region. So we have some localization, but that's hard. You can, it's hard to do that without a big organization and wait till the governments get into it. You know, people accept the fact that we've got retired South African judges, wait till the government of South Africa replaces the retired South African judges uh, and, and see how people are, see how happy people are about that. Yeah, could I ask too, I mean, so since so much of your audience, and correct me if I'm wrong, but so much of your audience is um, not in the U.S. Did you say that 20%? 80% 80% outside. 80% outside. That is a, a crazy statistic. So, I mean, are you, like, there, I guess what I'm wondering is, like, there has to probably be a big like international push like our I mean even beyond maybe beyond like regulation but even like content I guess you really need to in some ways rely on algorithms because you know you're in certain areas what's relevant to that area um but I mean is there have there I mean I'm sure there have been a lot of talks about like okay international development and what does this mean for Facebook going forward but um yeah I'm just so curious yeah, well, you know, again, back to um, the more international it is, the even harder government, harder government regulations going to be because you don't even have an obvious, you don't even have a logical government to do it. If, if it were just about the U.S., we'd know to hand it to the FCC, um, but you don't have, um, and and some governments like ours are subject to the First Amendment, 
So there's a, you know, that if we were subject to, the, if OSB, the Oversight Board, were subject to the First Amendment, that would really impact a lot of our decisions. Um, and we're not, luckily. We can take people down without violating their First Amendment rights because we're not a government. But wait till governments get into it and have and have that. So um, I, I just think I just think I keep coming back to, and a lot of this is based on my mutual fund experience. I, a lot of I just keep coming back to thinking, you know, people's instinct is always there's a problem. There must be a central government regulatory solution. And I'm walking around on the planet for 72 years, and if it's taught me anything, it's that no, step back, stop. All regulation isn't good regulation. Some regulation is good regulation. We died out on the fact that in mutual fund industry that we were regulated, so we knew that the you know fraudsters were going to stay away and find some other way to take people's money. Um, so we loved it. It was really good for us. And we, we touted it. We advertised how regulated we were. So regulation in some areas is good, but it isn't the answer to every, and particularly regulation far removed from the, the issues and the people. It is just not the answer to everything. And yet it's everybody's knee-jerk response. Problem, federal regulation, period. And there's so much stuff in between, and and I think I think consumers are going to help us. And uh, you know, I, I don't I don't even I opened my Facebook account actually several months after I took this job, so I wasn't a, I've used LinkedIn, but no none of the other social media. But my understanding is that a lot of other social media has become really popular uh, among people your age, and it they don't necessarily use Facebook, um, and so competition is going to be a really important aspect of this. If, people, if, if there's so much crap up on Facebook, somebody feels uncomfortable, they're going to go somewhere else. And so competition is going to you know, push us in the direction of making it a more comfortable experience, however that happens, than is any government rule that says, do this, don't do that. Paul, I was just wondering if we could go back to talk a, lot, a little bit about uh, regulations, because he did mention about regulations, and probably yes. the the, the a core of this is Section two hundred and thirty. Everybody's talking Correct. about Section two hundred and thirty these days. Yeah. Maybe we could um, s start there. And also, uh, I, I know you listened to uh, uh, my interview with Robert Barnes, who is the constitutional trial lawyer for Alex Jones, the infamous yeah. uh, conspiracy theorist Alex Jones. And Alex was uh, deplatformed basically everywhere uh, a okay. while ago and 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 everybody was saying you know the the facebook whatever what came after him and the twitter and, and so on so so i don't know what, what are your thoughts on section 230 and all the recent debates we have uh, on this and facebook's role in this yeah well look i think that section you know no law is perfect when you write it um and section 230 has been around for a long time and so i'm happy to have people look at it um if you i often said if you if you just simply delete section 230 then we will cure worldwide unemployment because all the unemployed people will be half of them will become plaintiffs lawyers suing facebook and the other half will become content reviewers at facebook taking things down that might end up being libelous. It's a slight exaggeration, but not much of one. If 2.30 were gone, how do you think Facebook would react? I'll tell you how they'd react. We'd take way too much stuff down. We just protect ourselves by taking too much stuff down so we couldn't be sued. Um, there's, this is a tangent, but there's something called New York Times, there's a case called New York Times v. Sullivan. And it said it's, it's a libel case and it's a Supreme Court case back, God, I don't know, in the 60s, I think, maybe 70s. Uh, but it, basically what it said was um, if a person, if you're, you can't be uh, found guilty of libeling a public figure, a person, if that person's a public figure. And it was to allow criticism of basically, it would allow policymakers to avoid libel suits. Well, at, over time, it's become the case that you can become a public figure by basically by being sued. So 
and they, they define the courts have defined public figure as public figure for this purpose. So as soon as you get sued, you become a public figure. So now everybody's a public figure. So now everybody, you have to prove malice in order to malice or gross negligence in order to bring a um, a libel suit. So if you if you keep if you get rid of section two thirty, and you keep Times v Sullivan, then everybody who everybody who sues who sues us for libel becomes automatically a public figure. And then we have to show actual intent at our level, at the Facebook level, so it will be protected. So, but what I'm worried is they narrow the definition of public figure, libel suits arise all around and we become overly responsible. So anyway. Yeah, Paul, I don't want to uh, linger too too much yeah. time on this, uh, on the section 230 thing, but it was really interesting. I was reading uh, an article by Ben Thompson, who was a very famous tech journalist, and he was saying that uh, Mark Zuckerberg's recent testimony on the Capitol Hill was very disappointing because I think Zuckerberg said something uh, about saying that he, he hoped Congress could take uh, actions on reforming uh, Section 230 uh, so that I think only companies with moderation infrastructures in place uh, should be able to, 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 to sort of keep this in place. And uh, ben Thompson, the journalist writing about this, was saying, you know, Z you know, Zuckerberg, uh, Zuckerberg um, la la launched Facebook in like 2004, and in 2012, Facebook had the IPO, and, and in 2017, you know, th that was the moment when when Facebook finally started to investing in security and moderation. So it was basically many, many years after Facebook became profitable and rich that they started to investing in this. But but by basically forcing uh, by basically changing Section 230 and forcing more moderation infrastructures, it would actually hurt the smaller up-and-coming companies nowadays because they don't have any moderation uh, infrastructure. They don't have any, you know, uh, time or capital to to devote in that. So historically, the antitrust rules have always been used by big companies and established companies <laughs> yes, to say they're competitors. I had a, I was testifying before Congress one time, and this. Yeah. Um, one of the staff members um, of the committee came up to me and said, I think we should force every company to be like Vanguard. And I, said, yes. <laughs> and I said, thank you. That's wonderful. My company's big. We could convert to internal management. Instantly. Yeah. You've just ended competition. For yeah. What about four of us? Do you really want to do that? Yeah. You know, you're right. You're right. I, 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 look, I don't think Mark was necessarily, I don't know what was going through his head, you know, whether he was really trying to destroy new entry um, by that, but I, I think he was, I hope he was, and I believe at least part of him was um, uh, endorsing the principles of self-regulation. If we, if, you know, one of the thoughts has been that Oversight Board becomes a self-regulatory organization and others join in, well, if we're self-regulatory, it's like, you know, FINRA is every broker dealer, whether it has one one employee or 20,000 employees is a member of FINRA and gets regulated by them. So, you know, join, your podcast can join the OSB. <laughs> Paul, Paul, we got to get uh, Mark on the podcast. I mean, I, I'm sure uh, we will have a lot of softball questions for him prepared. I'm sure he okay, Mark good. is the next guy to do. <laughs> Oh man. Well, I also I also want to ask too about how I mean I honestly live in social media. I wrote my thesis on social media. I think there's a part of me that's just, you know, completely in some ways overwhelmed by it. But I think that our social media lives like often play such a large role in, you know, our living life or, you know, our you know, real life too. And I I would be I'd kick myself if I didn't ask, just you know, how you see college campuses developing their regulations towards free speech. You know, in 2015, you know, years ago, Princeton, like in part, um, adopted the Chicago Statement right. on free speech, you know, these principles, you know, et cetera. I think that was a big step forward. Um, and I'd say that, you know, there are a lot of uh, professors here too at Princeton who are all for, I mean, I, of course, I'd say, you know, professors are, you know, for, of course, you know, free speech. I think that I want to caveat that though with, I think a lot of students 
are nervous to share their you know political beliefs but also just their beliefs in general because of course you're thinking okay how do grades factor in you don't know your the your professor's political leaning and and all of that and i think that that is creates a a very like unfortunate learning environment and so you know my question to you now is okay wait a second does this fall on the institution to build back up does this fall on the students to build back up I mean, and of course it's, you know, you're working in tandem, but you know, how can, uh, bottom line, like how can students like not feel as nervous, I guess, or I, or where do you really see free speech, you know, going in the future and how it can be regulated, you know, on college campuses? Well, a couple of things. I uh, wanted just to, to acknowledge where I stand. I'm, I'm a donor to Foundation for Individual Rights in Education. Princetonians for Free Speech was founded by a couple of classmates who of mine who are good friends. Um, they're doing an alumni faculty forum at the reunions coming up. So I hope you'll tune in. I may be doing one on Facebook if they can schedule it. Oh, wow. Right time. So look look for that. Uh, it's uh, about the 71 and 70 combining. Anyway, um, you know, one of the, here's, the, here's the problem, Francesca, that, that with things like the Chicago Free Speech Films, everyone is for free speech. And everyone is for every exception to free speech until the exceptions have swallowed the rule. And that's exactly, you're never gonna get anybody who says I'm not for free speech. But then as soon as you say, okay, well, should, free, should this be allowed? Well, of course not. And, and, you know, and you say yes to a, you say of course not enough times and you have no free speech. And, and that's just, that's, that, that's inherent in the topic. So just, Adopting free speech principles that doesn't get you very far. Um, I I think it's among the students. I think that that the a couple of things. We, you know, we're we're um, this this group that Robbie George has started, and that's called um, God. What's it called? Free speech something. Anyway, um, uh, that's a group of professors, and I've given money to that, and tend to give more. Uh, where you you support professors who are being you know, run out of town on a rail for saying something inappropriate and a genuinely free speech. We're not going to take on Me Too issues or incompetence issues or anything. It's got to be free speech. But the if we protect those, then it just it it just it 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 levels the playing field more. So an administrator thinks, okay, I got this howling mob over here and I got this one poor professor over here. Uh, I'm gonna, uh, you know, I, of course I'll toss him out and, and respond to the howling mob. Well, there's now a howling mob over here and a lot of money over here saying you can sue and we will support you uh, in your lawsuit against the university. And so I think that's gonna be helpful. I think it's gonna come, you know, if you've walked around on the planet as long as I have, you've seen a lot of pendulums and pendulums swing. And when they get too far, they swing back. And I can't tell you how many you know, social movements and, and social things that have just, that have been started out healthy and then gone too far, they, they swing back. Sometimes they need a little shove to swing back, but maybe, uh, you know, and I, I, think the, I think the issue is more with the students now ostracizing each other for their political beliefs. And I, and I think if, if there were an anti-ostracism club or something like that, it doesn't have to be a conservative club that's just as intolerant, but on the right. That, that, that isn't the solution. I think the solution is that there's a, there's a great big middle who just says, you know, like I said, no, you know, neither party gets it entirely right. Neither party gets it entirely wrong. Let's have a discussion instead of just taking sides. Well, it's really hard, Paul. We'll have to <laughs> we'll have to try our best to get there one day. But it just seems yeah. like we're well, people, going people, towards. Listen, what, 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 when things change, when people get tired of the same thing, and and the 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 left wing kids will get tired of having to be the thought police. They'll get tired of it, and they'll say, "Jesus, I, I'm just I'm going to quit walking around. Sh I'm really tired of shunning." somebody who says even the least bit of centrist or conservative thing, they'll get tired of it and they'll move on. I promise. Paul, would you mind uh, end this interview by giving us your punchline since the name of our show is Policy Punchline. We always ask at the end of uh, to our guests, uh, what would your punchline be? I mean, it could be about anything. You know, I think 
if there's a there's a this has been fabulous by the way thank you you, guys, you all have really asked good questions and the framing of your questions has has often been the often been the best part of the answer so thank you so thank much you, thank you for that it's really been good and you haven't just said talk about 230 you've also <laughs> teed it up in the right way but the um i guess you know it'd be very just be careful of regulation I, I I love regulation, but it is, if I could summarize anything, that the instinct to regulate, you, you, you just step back, just stop and think. You know, just stop and think. Don't get so emotional. Don't get such a hurry to fix a problem, and don't always go look and think. The oftentimes the cure is worse than the disease. And I won't go. In, I can when we get together again. If you do, I can go into some. Talking about that, where at, where at, regulation has actually made things worse, and it hasn't just been ineffective. It's actually made things made the exact thing you were trying to fix worse, and you just we just have to be willing to 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 think. Okay, this is a problem. How can we address it? And regulation can be one of the ideas, but it can't be all of them. And it can't be just the instant immediate go-to solution to everything, or we're really, we've screwed up before and we'll screw up again. The example I'll give you when we get back together is um, uh, CEO salaries. We regulated those and those went to the stratosphere when, when we collectively regulated them. And it was a huge mistake. And the other thing is, that nobody wants to, you know, deregulation is a Republican term and it's a curse word to many people. We changed it to re-regulation, but you gotta be willing to, you know, you're not gonna drive, I don't wanna drive a car very fast that doesn't have brakes and a reverse gear. And so when you do things, it's one of the things that we thought at, at we, we adopted the motto at NPR, fail fast. You've gotta be willing to undo things. And yet there's a whole body of thought out there that anybody who wants to revisit a regulation is in favor of chaos. No, we're not. Try things, change things, fail fast. That's just a wonderful punchline to, to end uh, this conversation for now, uh, Paul. Yeah, let's get together again. I want to get together just to see you guys. Absolutely. That would be great. So that was our interview with Paul Hager, who was the acting CEO of NPR National Public Radio. He was also the chairman of the board. He was on the board uh, for nine years, and he was also the former chairman of the Capital Research and Management Company, which was a, a giant in the mutual fund industry, uh, a very accomplished businessman in the media industry and finance industry. And he also uh, is the uh, trustee at Princeton University. So there was a wonderful conversation uh, across many different spaces in, in media and, and regulation and free speech. Uh, Francesca, thank you so much as well for, for joining me to co-host the interview. I hope you had a great time. Oh, it was great. Thank you, Tiger. Well, this concludes this episode of uh, Policy Punchline. You may find us on policypunchline.com. You can watch this interview on YouTube and listen to it on iTunes, Spotify, any of your preferred podcasting platform. Uh, we'll see you next time. Thanks so much for listening today. You've been listening to Policy Punchline, a podcast generously supported by the Julius Rabinowitz Center for Public Policy and Finance at Princeton University. We would also like to encourage you to follow other podcasts produced by Princeton University, such as Politics and Polls by the Woodrow Wilson School of Public and International Affairs. Policy Punchline is intended to be informational only and does not reflect nor represent the views of Princeton University or the Julius Rabinowitz Center for Public Policy and Finance. For more information on subscription, donation, volunteering, or contact, please visit policypunchline.com. Thank you again for listening.